Emma, we're going to be talking about the essential characteristics of the transition. And here at Inner Energy Media, we take the view that the real revolution in the, this energy transition is not the emergence of wind and solar and batteries on the supply side, on the power grid and distributed energy. It's really on the demand side, the ability to electrify devices like electric vehicles and heat pumps and industrial heat batteries, that kind of thing. That we couldn't <laughs> electrify them before. That's kind of our, our hypothesis. Would you agree or disagree? I think that it's definitely both uh, at the end of the day. But, but of course, it doesn't really matter how much wind and solar we produce if there isn't demand for electricity. So um, the renewable resources we have are electric uh, resources. So, of course, it's very important to the transition that the demand of electricity goes up. Um, and we see a huge amount of the demand of electricity coming from electric devices, uh, chief among them electric vehicles, heat pumps, but also uh, AC is growing enormously, um, data centers are growing enormously, and all of those things are electric. So I think it it really goes hand in hand. And again, our model is is very much demand, supply, and economically driven. Um, so we need that increase in electricity demand in order to justify the increases in the in the renewable supply that that our model shows. One of the big debates is, uh, and we have these with the oil and gas folks in Canada, is the role of primary energy demand. Because, you know, the, the, the famous growth that shows, you know, starting in 1945, and it just goes rockets up, you know, primary energy demand, oil, gas, coal, everything just gets thrown into the mix. But when you electrify things uh, on the demand side, it's so much more efficient and I think if I understand your uh, uh, report correctly, you kind of agree that uh, more efficiency actually lowers primary energy demand uh, at, in the yeah. end of the day. Is this, was that correct? Yes, absolutely. Um, so we see final energy demand more or less plateauing in the world um, from about the 2040s. Um, and that is because of electrification and because electricity usage is is much, much, much more effective um, than than fossil usage. Um, yeah, an ICE vehicle has a much lower efficiency than, than an electric vehicle. Um, so absolutely, yes. Uh, here's an intro. I, I find this very interesting. You emphasize the, the increasing role of energy security and in industrial policy. So we'll deal with energy security first. It used to be that energy security was the supply of oil, gas, or coal, uh, a reasonable amount at a reasonable price. And that was energy security. But now yep. energy security is the ability to generate electricity domestically and then deploy electric devices to consume that electricity. So electrifying basically the, the demand in your economy. It, it, would you agree that that's kind of the way energy, the, our understanding of energy? Yeah, absolutely. Is? Yes, I think so. I think so. Um, and fundamentally, renewables are a lot more energy secure because they're very impractical to have a long way away from your demand center. You can't really move them away around the way that you move uh, oil and gas and coal around. Um, and that's additionally true when you think about distributed energy resources. So um, rooftop solar, for example, um, is, is produced where it's consumed um, and then distributed from there. Um, so, yes, I'd absolutely agree that the, the concept of energy security is changing because uh, the makeup of our energy demand is changing because we demand a lot more electricity than we used to. Yeah. Um, you also emphasize industrial policy. And for our viewers who aren't aware, what that means is basically um, the government takes, the, the state takes a more active role in strategic planning and then uh, supports the development of, of both manufacturing of clean energy technologies and their and their deployment, kind of the China model uh, that we were talking yep. about earlier. Um, that's new uh, because we've had 40 years of, the, you know, where government intervention was was kind of you know, frowned upon. Uh, but now we're getting mm -hmm. back into that as we shift into these new energy models. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And you see that markedly within certain renewables. So contract for differences have been so important within wind. Um, and we see them coming back even a little bit uh, in the next decade or so. Um, 
they went down uh, for a while, but they they look like they're back. So, um, yeah, individual countries have their priorities, and a lot of countries' priorities are to do with the energy transition and energy security. And so they're interested in in supporting uh, um, technologies, particularly when they're still developing. So once they become more affordable, the LCOE drops, um, countries tend to reduce their support um, and then it becomes more of a of a free market. Here's an interesting observation. I was I was interviewing a fellow named Jorge uh, Varga from the United States. Uh, and of course, we know that China, uh, their solar panels are very, very cheap, like seven, eight, nine cents a watt, whereas the U.S. is yeah. somewhere in the 30, 30 cent range, 30 to 40 cent range. And, and he had a different view on it. He said, you know what? Uh, solar is is so cheap now, and so and especially paired with cheap batteries, that it doesn't matter that solar is nine cents in China and thirty cents a, a watt in the United States. It's still cheap, and and that's why yeah. and that's why uh, you know manufacturing in the U.S. makes sense. And that I think that observation can be applied to a lot of places who want to manufacture their own. A clean energy technology, you know, solar panels and batteries and EVs and, mm-hmm. and what have you. Is is that a tr- an emerging trend? Um, I mean, to be honest, I think we see that in most of the world, uh, imports of cheap Chinese um, technology are increasing. Um, there are certain areas where that's not true. Uh, the United States, um, parts of Europe are, are, are working on maintaining domestic manufacturing of certain technologies. Um, I think solar is is interesting um, because I think we have this idea that that panel prices are really important, but now a panel price uh, is nowhere near the majority of the LCOE or the capex breakdown. It's it's much more about uh, the labor costs in the local area, the grid connection complications, and so on and so forth. So I think um, that probably also is is where Jorge is coming from is that um, the solar panel is not the majority of the price of building a, a park anyways anymore. So that difference might not be as significant because it's quite possibly more important how much your labor costs are. Um, I also think, though, that that uh, more developed economies, and even China, for example, are shifting to be to producing more and more complicated items that are needed in the energy transition. So a lot of more complicated transformers are actually made still in, in Europe and in America, um, and then and and uh, even in China. And then we also see that that more simple solar panel manufacturing is now moving to Vietnam and Thailand. So I think that it depends on what you're manufacturing and and the specificities. But I do still think that um, the reduction in price caused by China's state investment in the manufacturing has been really instrumental in the energy transition where it is now. And most regions in the world, we expect to continue to import various technologies. Here's an interesting observation from your report, and that is that the transition is basically asymmetrical around the world. So China leads, Europe has focuses on policy, the US is up and down depending on what politics are. And the reason this is important in Canada is because we've been very spoiled here. You know, we have a grid that's 84% clean, it's reliable, it's very inexpensive. And so when we look at it from our lens, it doesn't look like the world is changing much. But on the other hand, when you go over to China and Asia, the world, it's a revolution. It's an energy revolution and it changed quite a bit. And do you find that that, is that observation makes sense? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's asymmetric, but it is it is universally true that the electricity grids are growing and greening. And it's also true that less developed regions, we expect their grid to grow much more significantly, which makes sense because they're earlier on in their transition. So it's it is asymmetric because of um, abilities and priorities. Um, but the world is still very much heading in the same direction. And what about the role of policy? Because uh, I know like in, in OPEC's modeling, they assume that policy support for clean energy technologies, including renewables, declines over time. Too expensive, consumers, you know, voters won't, won't support it. But you argue that the policy has now become more important than the technology. Could you explain? Well, we... Uh, I think that is partially because 
our report and our forecast is often described as fairly uh, technology optimistic and and policy maybe not pessimistic, but it, but not expecting enormous changes. Um, so I think maybe that could be framed also as if there were significant policy changes that would have a bigger impact on, on our forecast because we already assume a pretty strong technology base. Um, but policies are, of course, extremely important, especially in countries that are early uh, in their energy transition. And we see that a lot of the uptake in key technologies like electric vehicles, rooftop solar, uh, offshore wind have been policy driven and policy supported. And you often need that kind of initial uptake to fuel the rest of it, to get those learning rates going um, and to enable that technology to be brought into other countries that maybe don't have the financial ability to to uh, to afford the policy support. Um, and I think that's why we think the policy is so important. Um, let's wrap up the interview with a question about capital. Uh, is there enough capital in the world to drive the transition at the pace that we would like to see, you know, f to meet emissions targets and so on? Uh, is it a question of, uh, is it available? Is there enough of it? Or is it a question of how it gets deployed? Yeah, the energy transition is is certainly affordable, and we expect that in the coming decades we will spend less and less of our GDP on our energy sources. Um, so, so the transition is affordable. Of, of course, it's it's affordable to different extents in different places, um, but we don't expect that to be an issue. I think that there are other bottlenecks that slow the transition down that maybe aren't actually related to capital. And there are capital related challenges in certain regions, like the cost of capital is very expensive in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, and that makes the transition much more difficult. Um, uh, Emma, thank you very much for this. No problem.